Mastering always wins the award for a very misunderstood process to most, and it can be intimidating for a lot of mixing engineers. Uh, a lot of artists don't really understand it. They think it might be a, a process to correct for anything that might be wrong in a mix. Uh, a lot of people think that we take a mix and we think about what's wrong with this. Let me correct this, let me correct this, and there's nothing more to correct, therefore it's done. And it's actually, for us, nothing like that. It's nothing like that at all. It's really about sizing up what's being brought to you and in your mind's eye projecting where could this exist in the best way possible, in the most complete way possible. And what that really means for, for us, I believe, is connection. It's mastering equals connection. How do I connect with this music in the most effortless way? And therefore, the miracle of that is most people out in the world will have that same experience and that, that experience is shared, which is a very important thing. So what it means in terms of processing it doesn't mean it's only going to correct things. It means that on the way to realize this, those things get corrected by default. So in other words, if we're presented a mix and it's got too much bass, it doesn't mean we just zero in on that bass and try to take away some bass, or, or maybe the opposite would be, it doesn't have enough bass, let's add some in. It's how do we hit all birds with one stone? How do we adjust that bass to also make sure that the vocal and the melodic structure, as Gavin was saying in the song, your ear goes right to that, and you're left with this whatever the emotional uh, connection is. Is it, is, it a, is it a really exciting song that makes your hair on your arm stick up? Because if that's the case, that's what we're going for. We have to have that happen. Without that feeling, we're not done yet. Is it a song that makes you feel some, some sorrow, some remorse? How do you realize that? Well, maybe you have to put yourself in that headspace. Maybe a memory is gonna, is gonna call that out of you. And that doesn't happen in mastering. It, just, it doesn't just happen in mastering, it happens from the very, very beginning of the songwriting process. Maybe the artist is in that place, then the mixer has to be in that place. Somebody sends us a batch of 12 songs for an album, we could talk on the phone for hours and hours about what we should do, all the decisions that we're gonna make, but what does most of the talking is the music itself. As soon as we put it up on the speakers or the headphones, we take all of that, that information in, we take all of that emotion in, and then we react. And we do our best work if we, we actually react very quickly. Usually. Uh, your first reaction is the best one. It's very similar to in the studio, the first take on the guitar, even when the mics are being still set up, that's usually the take to, to capture. Take 30 is not really gonna be there because the, the life and the emotion is gone. So it's very much the same way in our process. We react based off our instincts, off our musicality, and at the end of the day, this is a technical process, but it's very much a musical process. And I don't think that's an aspect that a lot of people necessarily know about until they experience it themselves. One of the things we like to do as a facility is combine technologies. And so while we take a digital file as a mix, predominantly, I mean, the, the days of analog tape mixes coming in are pretty much over at this point. So a digital mix will come in, and we can pull out a plug-in if, um, if necessary. But generally speaking, that song will go through an interface, usually a universal audio interface, that's externally clocked and then into our console and then gets recaptured in another workstation. And we use uh, mostly WaveLab for captures and, and then making of references and all the deliverables that are necessary out there. So if we use a plugin to maybe help adjust that mix a little bit based on a discussion we've had with the client, we'll pull out you know, um, Universal Audio or a Fab Filter or something like that. We, we like the vibe of those plugins. But um, one of the things that we really like to do is figure out how to work on the body of the music and then how to work in the mid of the music and then you know the the air up top as well so generally speaking we like a nice punchy low end and solid state equalization is favorable for that the tube EQs that we use we use uh, EAR equalizers from Tim De Paravicini in England and we like to saturate those and push level into those and really get a nice warm toasty mid-range and a nice silky air, but nothing bright, just something open without being edgy. Uh, and then hold it up with a punchy low end. So we'll combine equalizers. Um, I've got a GML 9500, which I really like to create that punchy low end. From there we'll go into, maybe we'll combine uh, solid state limiters, tube limiters, compressors, that sort of thing. And maybe even a plug-in for the soft clip at the end to make sure we have no overs and that sort of thing. But you've got to be very careful when you do that because you don't want that to be audible. Uh, we have to really work with the dynamic range. One of the things I think we're known for is to, is, is to make sure that the dynamic range of a music is intact. And sometimes it's a challenge. If you have to push the level of the music and compress it a little more, we have to then ride the equalization of the music to 
to keep the perceived dynamic range in place. So there's all types of creativity and tricks of the trade and all that stuff combined to end up with that focus that you need for that music to go out to the consumer and the fans to connect with those songs. The reissue music that we work on, it's an interesting challenge because you have to bring two worlds together. You have to bring um, the world of what the music used to sound like and the world of what's expected it to sound like today and kind of combine them into one thing. And you're dealing with people that remember the music from many years ago. And so you have to also present them with something that feels like how they remember it. But if you actually go to the original recording, it's nothing like what they remember it. It's the new version of it. And they've become older and a product of the world they now live in. So you have to combine all of these elements up to create something that actually sounds a little bit different than a modern day recording, but has got flavors of it. And it also has the flavors of the old recording. So um, it's, it's tricky and um, interesting to come up with the formula that really works for the sonic stamp of reissue recordings. And another funny thing is sometimes we're actually at the worst advantage possible because we're working with tapes that have been baked over the years a few times and been living in the atmosphere. So we're, we're in a position where we have to make something as good as it ever has been while using something that is, is from a source that has been compromised as it ever has been at the same time. So navigating all of that, and it's just the situation that anybody be in in this position. Uh, there's nothing that we can do. We're, we're at the mercy of the, the physical, tangible tapes themselves. So that's always something to, uh, to navigate as well. And even 96K is, um, you know, it's not really what the human brain is capable of hearing. And the human ear is nothing but a portal to the brain. The brain is the, is the organ that decodes this information. You know, what you're hearing, your brain is processing. And you can hear up to 100 kilohertz. Not consciously, it's subconscious. And there's a guy named Dr. John Diamond who did all these studies about how the brain perceives this ultra harmonic information that's not included in speakers and technology and digital capture technology. So uh, only when you get up to double the 96K, you know, like, like 192 and above there is when you start to get that ultra harmonic information back into the picture of audio. And that's when stuff sounds, so, starts sounding natural. So even 96K ultimately eventually will be outdated.